when it comes to cancer, it's not really about eating certain special foods to avoid it. It's about avoiding the poisons that bring it on, such as sugar. The Warburg effect was discovered in the 30s by Otto Warburg, and this earned him a Nobel Prize for his efforts. It was shown that very large amounts of glucose were being taken into cancer cells many, many times what a normal cell could possibly use to produce energy. While this is portrayed as the process cancers use to create ATP, in reality what it does with glucose is far, far worse than that. Because of the implication. Okay, that, <laughs> <laughs> that seems really dark. I gotta lose some weight. Trying to starve cancer, like many therapies today attempt, is ultimately a losing strategy. That's not to say fasting is useless against cancer or a low carb diet is useless against it. But that's not really the mechanism of action against it when you fast, for example. The reason you can't starve it is that the body always needs glucose and your body will make it out of the glycerin backbone of fat as it burns it, even if you never consume any for your whole life, and also from lactate byproducts within your cells. What a cancer cell does with glucose that's so dangerous is fermentation. The P53 gene that doctors are so wary of is actually the fermentation gene, which doctors are not taught in medical school. Fermentation does produce some ATP, and critically, it works even when no oxygen is present, but the amount produced is actually very low. The mitochondria can produce two forms of energy, one through oxidative phosphorylation, which is the primary source, and a very tiny amount through substrate level phosphorylation. But in cancer, it's flipped. The majority is coming from substrate level phosphorylation and very little from oxidative phosphorylation. Even though oxygen is being consumed at a rate that would be predictive of oxidative phosphorylation. But the oxygen being consumed in the cancer cell is not used for, for ATP. It's a variety of other oxygen requiring reactions inside the cell, independent of ATP synthesis. The field is now locked in a misunderstanding about using oxygen consumption as an accurate surrogate for oxidative phosphorylation, and it's, inac it's not accurate. The danger is that fermentation is how cancer produces proteins and other materials that are needed for cell replication. Glucose is comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and guess what proteins and fats are both mainly comprised of? That's right, the same thing plus a few other easily available atoms here and there, such as nitrogen. Using glucose and a smattering of other elements, a cancer cell can easily and quickly generate any protein it could possibly need to divide and grow. In fact, this is how almost every single essential amino acid in your own body was produced in the first place. The reason they're essential is that they are so common that the body doesn't need to make them unless they're eating a diet humans are simply not designed to eat. So therefore it doesn't. Instead we get them from animals and from plants. But the cows and plants actually get them from bacteria in their gut or amongst their root system or by eating other animals. When you ferment foods such as dairy, many of the carbohydrates are consumed and what do they become? Mainly they become proteins but they can also become healthy fats like conjugated linoleic acid, which is not the same as linoleic acid, but is a healthy fat. And you find this in grass-fed dairy, but you usually don't find it in other foods. A lot of influencers promoting the sugar diet should take note because this is the real nutrition that's needed to build muscle. You need not only protein, but healthy fats and micronutrients like taurine, without which all protein folding and therefore all muscle growth is simply impossible. These guys talk big, but they use TRT and PEDs to get lean looking, and they use camera angles and filters to look big, but in person, it's usually another story. I've come across some of these clowns over the years, and they look much less impressive in person. Oh! <laughs>
<laughs> oh, we're all extremely large and strong here. <laughs> If you can't starve the cancer of glucose, then it would seem hopeless, but you can control the damage that leads to cancer. According to the mitochondrial theory of cancer proposed by Dr. Seyfried and backed up by extensive research, cancer starts as mitochondrial damage. This is borne out by the fact that everything which damages mitochondria leads to cancer. For example, non-lethal doses of radiation cause a great deal of mitochondrial damage and they tend to lead to cancer many years later. If it were the case that it directly mutated the genes of cells in order to cause cancer, it would come on more or less instantaneously after radiation exposure. Your body is also very good at cleaning up nuclear DNA damage, so it's puzzling how this could happen. Well, it's not very puzzling when you realize that your mitochondria are inv involved with cleaning up nuclear DNA damage and that mitochondrial DNA damage is much less easy to repair because each mitochondrion, which is the singular for mitochondria, has only one copy of each gene instead of two. That means that as mtDNA damage builds up, the cells become more and more defunct. And when there are little or no healthy mitochondria left, then you get a senescent zombie-like cell. And if this zombie-like cell is not cleaned up by the immune system, then it just constantly shoots out hormones that cause inflammation all through the body. And this is a big part of aging because it can lead to immunosenescence over time. And eventually, they're just going to get more and more mutations and they're either going to die off or they'll hit the jackpot and become a cancer cell. Once they become cancerous, they start sucking up glucose and using it to create the material it needs to divide, and they divide faster and faster over time. Pretty soon your whole body is full of these rampaging zombie cells doing who knows what to your body. Which one? What's the matter? What you are about to see is a nightmare, inexplicably torn from the pages of Kafka. Great, you say, but how do I avoid mitochondrial damage? Simple, really. Avoid carb burning as much as possible. This is going to create at least 66% more reactive oxygen species, or ROS, compared to burning fat. Your cells, thankfully, always burn more fat than carbs, except during very intense exercise where not enough oxygen is available to burn fat. And unlike carbs, cells require oxygen to burn fat. And this includes cancer cells. When you eat carbs, insulin goes up, and this causes inflammation that impedes oxygen flow around the body. And it can still work quite well at the kidney level. And one of the jobs of uh, insulin at the kidney level is to actually hold on to sodium. So that's actually a, a much more important factor for increasing the sodium in your body and causing high blood pressure than is the amount of sodium that you consume. If you consume a, a modicum of sodium but have very high insulin levels, your body's going to try very hard to hold on to all of that sodium. You can, uh, on the other hand, consume a whole lot of sodium but have very good low insulin levels and any excess sodium that can you consume will just come out in your urine. This causes a lot of damage to the cell, and the cell has no choice but to try and produce energy in other ways. Some of these ways include using alpha-ketoglutarate as a safe substrate for an energy production. And this is very important for your stem cells, which are in low oxygen environments most of the time. But the main thing that happens is that carb burning is done without oxygen. This means the mitochondria cannot clean up the ROS generated in the process. And this creates a lot of damage in the cell and especially to the mitochondrial DNA. This also leads to very dangerous genotoxic substances such as malondialdehyde being created. And this causes a great deal of damage to the mitochondria and this leads directly to cancer over time. And while there's only some damage as we age, 
This can be greatly influenced by diet, especially by eating fewer carbs. On the other hand, when fat is burned, it's a much different scenario. Carb burning can actually fail within the mitochondrial production process of ATP, but fat burning skips several steps of this process. That means not only does it produce more ATP, but it also always provides enough ATP to clean up the reactive oxygen species. And it also usually provides some to help clean up any that was previously done as well. This is one reason that vinegar is very nifty because it goes right through mitochondrial walls and will give them the extra energy they need even if they're very, very damaged. That's very important because it is the mitochondria that implement apoptosis in cells and that's what they do when they become very damaged but only if they have the energy to do so. That means if a cancer cell has oxygen and fat available and burns some for fuel or a senescent cell does, this could lead to apoptosis, which means controlled cell death, and that will get rid of the cancer cell and it will keep the senescent cells from causing inflammation that causes problems in other cells. So fat burning actually increases apoptosis in cancer, especially when you burn the short chain fatty acid vinegar, which is what all fat and glucose must be reduced to before it ultimately gets turned into ATP. But this is a complicated process and damaged mitochondria can't always perform it properly. Using oxygen inside the cancer cell can also destroy it directly by causing the oxidation of large amounts of minerals that the cancer cells tend to hoard for their rapid growth. The lower your insulin levels, the more fat you're going to burn because insulin simply impedes fat burning. And that means you're gonna burn more carbs instead and you're gonna get more cancer. And you're also gonna have less inflammation in the body, which is also going to help keep you from getting cancer. So while many doctors will tell you tons of nonsense about what causes cancer and tell you to eat magic foods or it's all genetic, in reality it's pretty simple. Keep your insulin down, keep your cancer down. If you can keep your insulin down, you're also gonna keep your cancer at bay for as long as possible. Lowering your carbs will also help a ton here and doing some fasting will help even more. Better yet, do both. One of the criticisms that we often uh, get is that it is possible technically to implement uh, a ketogenic diet that is either neutral or, or not beneficial for, uh, for the treatment of cancer. I, I have to say, at least from, from, the, study, from the human studies that I uh, have seen, uh, and please, if somebody knows about any other, uh, we are happy to hear about them. Uh, in, in no single human study of, of ketogenic diets, for, for cancer treatments, there have been re reports of like hyperprogression or accelerated tumor growth. So it's either neutral or it's, it's beneficial. However, in, in animal models, due to the differences in, in metabolism between uh, you know, mice and, and humans, uh, you, can have, you can design a pro-tumoral uh, uh, ketogenic diet, or at least you could see in, in studies when they are at libitum, so this means where the ketogenic diet is unrestricted, uh, you see sometimes that the, the benefits are not as pronounced as the researchers would want. It's usually not an acceleration, acceleration of the tumor growth, but you could have you know, neutral effects also. And we often get these, these studies uh, you know, shown to us like, hey, you see ketogenic diet sometimes also doesn't work. Uh, in, in this case, what you have usually is basically you don't have a caloric restriction effect, so the mice do not lose weight. And you see that the ketones are high, so you can have moderate to high ketonemia, but the glucose is not reduced. The glucose is also either normal or, or even high. So, of course, if, if there is sufficient primary fuel, which is the glucose and the, the glutamine for, for the tumor, and you're just adding excess fuel and excess calories uh, to, to the to the system, uh, then of course you could have, you know, neutral effects or or even acceleration of tumor growth. So so this is one of the one of the reasons why we put the emphasis on the on the chronic reduction of, of the GKI 
and the definition of dietary ketogenic metabolic therapy as, as a way to, to mimic um, fasting metabolism. If you are not mimicking fasting metabolism, then you are not implementing a therapeutic ketogenic diet. You might still implement a, a ketogenic diet that increases ketones but doesn't lower glucose and maybe lose weight or, 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 or um, maybe have improved for sure. You can have improved uh, you know, insulin signaling. So for type 2 diabetes, this is a great tool without weight loss. Uh, but in, in general, uh, there should be a little bit of restriction, a little bit of caloric restriction. A low carb diet also tends to be full of nutrition from animal products. Nutrients like taurine and K2 are required to fight off cancer and cancer rapidly depletes them. It's easier to just supplement these nutrients by far in the modern environment if you don't live on a farm, but a little known but plentiful K2 source is beef or lamb kidney. Taurine is also plentiful in beef heart and in head cheese. And there's also many other nutrients in liver which can help, which I've discussed in other videos. So if you're worried about cancer or have simply run down your system with a bad diet over the decades, you should really consider some organ meat. I buy an organ grind online sometimes that has 20% organ content within the ground beef. It's not cheap by any means, and it doesn't taste, look, or feel quite the same or quite as good as the regular grass-fed beef that I get, but it's very, very nutritious. Like cancer cells, that's also what you need to survive, not ATP, and you can get enough from 500 calories worth of food, enough ATP that is, but you could never get proper nutrition from 500 calories worth of food a day and the more carbs you have in your diet, the more nutrition you're ultimately missing out on. You want Twinkie? That's his lunch? Oh, he is so going to be punished. Everyone's getting spanked but me. I've talked about some of this in the past, but not only does it bear repeating, but it's critical for people to understand that it is the building blocks cancer can make out of glucose that are dangerous, not ATP production. In fact, the ATP from fat burning can help the mitochondria to cause apoptosis in cancer cells and destroy them. It's also important to know it's not mysterious how cancer forms anymore. The higher your insulin and the more carbs you eat, the more inflammation you'll have in your body and the less oxygen you'll have in the body and the more damage you're doing to your mitochondria. And all of these things are sooner or later going to catch up with you. That makes the sugar diet the worst thing you can do as far as cancer is concerned. Even if you're a vegan who stuffs their stomach full of spinach leaves, so you only eat very few calories every day, you might seem metabolically healthy, but you are also nutritionally deficient. And this is also going to catch up with you in time, just like it did with Steve Jobs. Well, where's the fun in that? Oh, we cater for all sorts here. You'd be surprised. 